seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Tiger interview series. Today, we have Jared Waldoff, who is a Tigers coach for us. And in his previous life, he was in compliance. And before you turn off the <laughs> video or audio and be like, Whoops. this is going to suck. Now we're going over <laughs> Joe Rogan. Yes. yes. Um, the reason I want to bring Jared on is because, one, I think from a recruiting standpoint, it's always good for players to understand what's happening in the compliance side of things. Also, I want to go into the um, – I'm very curious on different things that happen throughout the NCAA. And I feel like ESPN doesn't, doesn't do a very good job when it goes into that. And I think there's a reason for that, but I would like to go down how you would approach it and what, how, how things actually operate inside of a compliance office inside of a major university mm -hmm. because um one it's obscure not many people know what happens in there i know when i was playing it was literally um oh that's the compliance guy and then that was it it was like this mysterious dude that or gal that you didn't want to talk mm -hmm. to and you try to avoid like the black plague right but before we jump into this conversation i want you to do a quick elevator pitch give us your background 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Um, give us like a macro view of who you are. Um, well, my name's Jared Waldoff, as you said. Um, I went to uh, Kaskaskia College, junior college in Illinois, out of high school, and then transferred to Southeast Missouri State University to play. Um, finished up my degree there in business administration, and then actually worked my way and just kind of found myself in compliance. It wasn't something that I set out to do. I just found myself in that position um, as assistant director of compliance at Southeast. Um, was there for two and a half years and then decided to make a career change. Um, so now I'm in law school at St. Louis University. Is it kind of like a club where like the black robe comes over and be like, we want you and then you end up joining compliance? Uh, kind of. They're always looking for help. That's for sure. <laughs> um, it's it's not something where they just have people lining up at the door to assist yeah. or jump in, you know. But uh, I was needing an internship actually, and I knew I wanted to do something inside of college athletics, and so that was the fastest way to get in there. And so I took it, and then after a two month internship, they're like, "Hey, we want you full time." So and that kind of goes with law school technically because you're dealing Absolutely. with legislation yeah. oh, yeah. and everything like that. Like yeah. it's. I feel like that's a pretty comparable thing. Like it was like, oh, that's a no brainer. I'm going to go to law school. Yeah. And it was actually the funnel that led me there. I had never really considered it that much um, to go to law school prior, but, and we can get into this, but you spend a lot of time with people who have law degrees in compliance. Um, you work with a lot of um, people who have their law degree at the NCA. We worked a lot with legal counsel for universities. So that kind of gave me the, um, insight to like what law school was like and I was looking around as like oh I, that sounds interesting I could do that and then just kind of made the jump so when like explain compliance just so that everyone's on the same page because we've said this word a bunch of times and obviously someone can do basic grammar and say oh that's that makes that's that's what compliance is but kind of give us a brief overview of like what compliance is from an NCAA standpoint um it's a little hard because it's very broad, um, depending on your institution's level, obviously. I mean, big D1s have a very large compliance office. Smaller schools have one or two. Um, but basically what compliance does is everything from, like I said, working with the NCAA in terms of what's the new legislation this year? What are the rules coming out that apply to athletes, coaches, administration at those schools? Um, then we also work with incoming student athletes. Um, how do I get eligible? What do I need to do to get eligible to be here? Um, coaches have a million questions every day, like a million questions of, hey, can I do this? Um, am I allowed to get this player to come here? And what's my budget? Um, so really, we work a lot with every single part of a college athletic, um, with a college athletics department, like whether it's business, whether it's the AD, whether it's 
marketing, like we kind of have our hand in everything. Um, and a lot of times we're just there to answer questions, to keep student athletes educated, to keep coaches educated and to make sure we are within the NCAA's rules and try to avoid as many violations as possible. So does an athlete, so athlete obviously gets into admissions, right? So coach recruits the player, um, says, Hey, I want you to be here. Kid orally commits, then signs. He's technically not yet a university student yet. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, is not guaranteed yet because he has to pass admissions, correct? Right. Then does he have another layer where you guys actually background check the recruits so that so, everything is compliant? Yes. So so that's actually a third layer that no one really thinks about that you have to pass. One, you have to get the coach's eye, which is recruiting. Mm-hmm, correct. Then you sign. Then you have to get into admissions. Mm-hmm. You actually have to get accepted to the school. Then you have compliance to get through. So, yes, in a sense, but mesh those all together. So it's not necessarily step-by-step. So compliance, um, I mentioned that we work with a lot of different people. One of the people we work super, super close with is admissions. Um, I basically felt at times like I was half an admissions officer because once a coach finds a player, they'll come to us and say, here's this player's name. Um, How does he check out? Okay, and then, and I know we want to get into this later on, is kind of we'll go in to the eligibility center, um, look him up, make sure he's there. And then we're going to start pulling grades and things like that to see if he's even eligible to come to the institution because a coach mm-hmm. wants to know right off the bat, mm-hmm. can he even come here? And if he can't, okay, we're just going to move on, you know? Um, but so then, then you, do you have to like give them that bad news? Like, Hey, just to let you know, Johnny's yeah. not going to be yeah, able that, to come That here. six foot four, 90 mile per arm. No, nah, not eligible. Yeah. And that does happen, and then immediately their question is, well, what can we do? You know, and then, again, that's where we come in. It's like, okay, here's where he's at. Here's what he needs to do to become eligible. And then we're going to work directly either with that student athlete or with whatever school he's at, whether it be high school or junior college. We're so work where, with do, where do compliance offices get in trouble? Because you hear these stories of, like, Louisville, Tennessee, USC, the Maurice Claret. Mm. throwing that out of the history bag. Yeah. Like how do these compliance offices offices like know is this player going to go off on the deep end? And then like cuz you guys control the coaching staff, right? It's pretty you you're you're dealing with them on an everyday basis and like if I have a relationship with someone, I'm going to they're not going to they're not going to mess up anything. Right. But those players like example, the Maurice Claret or Reggie Bush situation where he was accepting mm-hmm. money. Like, how do you control that? It's hard. Um, it's definitely something where our job is to educate, right? To be there to educate. So we try to get in front of student athletes as much as physically possible. Now, they might not always like to see us walk in and have a team meeting with us. Like, they hate it, right? As an athlete, you want to be on the field. You want to be in the weight room. You want to be doing something else, right? Yeah. I'm the last person you typically want to see, but like I always intro our meetings with those guys, like, listen, I'm not here to bug you. I'm not here to talk to you and bore you to death. I'm here to make sure that you're on the field doing what you want to do. Right. But to answer your question, it, I mean, it's hard. You're relying a ton on your coaches. Um, we are starting, I think it's becoming a trend for um, athletic departments to do a little bit more of a background check on athletes. Mm -hmm. It hasn't in the past. You're typically relying on your coaching staff, um, to recruit quality guys and people. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's starting to become more of a thing to kind of dig a little deeper. Um, but we rely on coaches, you know, you try to build a good relationship and trust with coaches to educate them, um, so that they can educate their players. And then at the end of the day, it comes down to what kind of People not saying that Reggie Bush is a bad person by any means. Yeah, um, but I mean it's, it goes back to um, I actually just got done watching the movie Midway, and okay. one of the Dave's giving me a look like the the ana- this analogy is going to be really interesting. Let's see how this. I, plays I love out. I'll try to see to how it goes. I'll try to follow. I haven't seen it, so I'll try to follow. Along. Okay, so Midway is about Pearl Harbor, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So before the movie starts, before Pearl Harbor happens, five years prior, one of the generals was in Japan and being a liaison and talking to. Um, it was there was a trade embargo, and basically what happened was the Japan um, the Japanese general told the American general, "Be very careful that you don't cut off our supplies because if you keep on cutting off our supplies, you're 
there's going to be a problem and we're going to have to retaliate and actually do something about it. And it was basically based on oil. So my point is, is like these players come from bad situations Mm -hmm. where they don't have the resources and they're in college. And then you have John over here who is, comes from a middle-class family, well off. And then you have, um, let's just say Tim from a lower class family and he doesn't have the resources. So when he comes to the university, he gets all this stuff. Like, don't get me wrong. Like universities take care of you. Yep. Like it's mm-hmm. impressive. Oh, like yeah. you're, you're class a, like you're basically a thoroughbred horse and they make sure that you're, you're top and bottom. But at the same time, there's that pain point where I don't have spending money. I'm mm-hmm. st- I'm living in an apartment. That's not really all that great. How, is that a red flag for, or like not where I wouldn't say a red flag, but more of a concern point when a coach recruits somebody from a family side, that's not as well off as somebody else. Um, I wouldn't, like you said, I wouldn't call it a red flag. It's definitely something that, you know, like you, like, you want to look out for that person. Absolutely. And yeah. it happens a ton. And to be quite honest with you, I think a lot of institutions um, have resources in place for students like that. Um, cause you're more than likely that's you're like, again, if, if I'm in that situation and I'm trying to do survival mode, I'm more than likely going to fa- figure out, Oh, I'll, I'll sell my ring on eBay yeah. sure. and get $10,000 right. for it. Now that, that gives me a leeway into the next right. rent mm-hmm. rental apartment or food outside of what the NCA right. gives me. Um, spending money on the weekends because some guys don't even get fed on the weekends. Like it just, it makes sense to me that that would happen. So like, has the NCAA thought about, Hey, let's, let's take care of these guys. Yeah. And you know, are there things that can always be done? Yes. I think there needs to be more done. Um, there are a lot of processes in place that many people outside of working in an athletics department don't, don't know about. Um, So every institution has a student athlete assistance fund. So it's SAF. Um, That money comes directly from the NCAA. So all these TV contracts that they get for March Madness or college Mm -hmm. football playoff, they distribute it through student athlete assistance fund. Now it's up to the compliance office um, to regulate that. Right. So if we have a student athlete that comes to us and says, Hey, you know, I have a toothache. It's not sports related. I have to go to the dentist to get it pulled. I don't have the money but it needs to be done. Okay. Well, that's something that we can cover. Right. So it operates like an HSA fund basically. Yeah. But again, that comes down to the student athlete coming to us or the coach relaying it to us that somebody needs some help. Um, so, and that's limited, right? Um, that's a limited amount of money and typically. So each department has a pool of money. Each for that situation, like if it's a hard, a hard situation, they have that pool of money or is it like the conference that has the pool of money? So it's each institution. Okay. Each institution will have, um, a student assistance fund. Now, how much can vary? Um, there is a, a, like a minimum amount that each one has to get. I don't remember what that is. Um, but each school, and again, I'm talking in division one level. I don't know. I didn't spend time in it division two or division three or NAI school. So I'm not sure how that works there. Um, so if I'm speaking, it'll probably be division one level, but yeah, every institution has a student athlete assistance fund and the NCAA does have, um, some other, um, routes that they could go, but they are a little trickier. There's just a lot of red tape to work around. Do you, do you remember like what the requirements are for you guys to actually give assistance on that? It has to be a lot of times it was medical or there were multiple times where they needed a flight back home. Mom's sick. Mm. There's a funeral or something like that. If it's a family matter or if it's going to benefit the student athletes well-being, we can pretty much write it off. Or if it's a health matter right now, they're not just going to let us just dish it out for no reason. Right. We have to have a reason. Um, it has to be documented and it typically needs to be urgent and benefit the student athletes, either health or well-being. That's a big phrase with the NCAA. If it benefits their health or well-being, you're good. Did that happen a lot? Did that did did a lot of student athletes come to you, or a lot of coaches or departments come to you for that? Just we, out of curiosity. Yes, we could have used more student okay. athlete assistance wow. fund money. 
Um, really? So I, you, you, you tap it out yeah. almost. And I'm talking like we're in the $35,000, dollars $55,000 range. Wow. As like a total amount that we were using. And, and that's every well, year. And technically, that's not, that's not that much for no, how many athletes you have. Right. It's like, really not. I mean, what's a typical amount of athletes in a department? Um, I think we had right around 400 to 450. Oh yeah. I mean, if you split that money up, there's not much there. No, no. And again, that, that that's not going to cover like the foods on the weekend. You know, if somebody comes to us and it's like, Hey, I need McDonald's cause I don't have any food this weekend. We can't really use that. We can do a lot of other things to try to help them, but student athlete assistance funds probably not going to cover that. Yeah. Cause I mean, some scholarships don't even cover the, cover the food. Right. Mm. No, especially in baseball. Yeah. And a lot of other... Well, you'll get it on the weekends, right? On sti- You'll have stipend if right. the university is not having meals or anything. Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Now, break down, break down the athletic department because I feel like it would be really good for someone to really understand the different, different sides, like different areas of the department because when a student athlete goes in, I didn't know this, like who, what tools are there for them or what key players that they can use and access. Because like when I walked into the athletic department, I just thought, Oh, this is just like high school. I just have my coat, my head coach and my assistant coach. And that's the only people that I can Mm -hmm. really access to. Then I started realizing like, Holy cow, I have this Mm -hmm. person. I have that person. Like break down a typical like D one school, um, resources inside the athletic department. Sure. Um, well, I'll start off with the two big ones because I was like you, I had no idea. I was just showing up to play, right? Mm -hmm. Play and here, here's class, you know, like go to class. Um, like it's amazing, like how much stuff there is that you can access. And I don't think a lot of athletes realize that when they step on campus as a freshman or even a junior, they're coming from junior college. Yeah. The two big ones, obviously, um, academic support center, right? Division one schools and pretty much every school, even in junior college, I had two people that were there dedicated to student athlete success, right? Mm -hmm. That's the main one. Um, find out where that building is located, find out who those people are and become best friends with them. Oh, it's like free. You get free tutoring, tutoring. which is crazy. Like, um, here's, here's an example. So, um, my mom passed away my senior year of college and in the spring. So like Mm -hmm. I literally, I missed month to months of school. I just shut down. I was like, I'm not dealing with school. I'm not dealing with homework. I was like, I'll take the F's. And my coach, the coaching staff was like freaking out because I was going to be the starting center fielder. And so what happened was the athletic department realized what was happening and they ended up like get hiring one of, one of the, um, former students that was in the economics program Mm -hmm. because I was, I was on the economic side. Not many athletes did that. Mm -hmm. So they had to go outside, pay somebody to help me get my grades back to where they were. And he was literally my tutor from the starting point of like when I shut down to he's like, he kept on communicating with me every week. And then to the end of my, like the spring of senior year, because I had to make up all those class time from the fall. Yeah. That's amazing. Yep. Yeah. And there are multiple of those, like at SEMO, for instance, we had, I think eight student tutors who we, like you said, we were paying them to be in the athletic success center is what we called ours. Um, you literally walk in, it's quiet. You have, like three full-time staff at least um you might be assigned one for your team as a whole and she's like he or she is your go-to person like hey i'm struggling in this class Mm -hmm. i'm struggling with this professor and then their job is basically to make sure that you're getting the resources you need um and then they can assign you an individual tutor if you're struggling in economics and they don't have an economics tutor they'll go out and find one Um, so that's like the main number one resource that I think every student athlete needs to know about and use. And that's the one you're going to see the most, like you're going to become best friends with those people and you should, um, like think about the expenses on that. Yeah. I don't think people realize the, how much that costs to get that done and literally dedicate towards an athlete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And going back a little bit to what you said about, you know, coming from a, if student athletes coming from a bad background or maybe just not your normal upbringing, right? Those are the student athletes that really need to take advantage of that because, you know, maybe they didn't have a great parent figure in their life, or maybe they just didn't have one because they passed away or something. Those people, you are going to see those, um, officers and resource outlets. You're going to see them every single day. Mm -hmm. Like when you go on a road trip, they'll be there. 
They'll be making sure that you have time set aside to study and things like that. So definitely take advantage of those. Okay. So we've got the academic Academic, side. The other one would be compliance. Honestly, I mean, like I said, it's so you not, think that's a, that's a very, super valuable for yes. the athlete to oh, develop yeah. a relationship with the compliance 100%. officer. 100%. Because which I I wouldn't I didn't know that. Like yeah. I didn't, even, I, know, I, I didn't I, even know who my compliance officer was. Like I knew who the guy was and I talked to him every once in a while, but I like I didn't really see him as like valuable. I was like I thought it was more for the coaches. I knew my mm-hmm. SI C? No, sports information. Yeah. Yeah, S- I forget. They've changed. Well, whatever. They've changed names. I, knew, times. I yeah. knew that, but I didn't know my <laughs> compliance guy. I just remember I couldn't take photocopies. Like that was like a no, no in our office. Yeah. Like literally we could not take a photocopy <laughs> yeah. in the academic center, but I could go to the library and take. Why? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that, and that's one of my questions for Jared. I want to know why that was, he might not even have an answer. He's like, that's a weird rule. But I, it literally had posted up like in our academic athletic center that if you take a photocopy without help, like I needed someone to help me take a photocopy, they would take my scholarship away. Yeah. Um, I can hit on it real quick <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, I don't want to date you by any means. You're not an old guy. But oh, like shit. <laughs> the NCAA got rid of a lot of those rules in like 2012 ish. Yeah, well, that's when I was a senior in college. Yeah. Like 2012 was the year there was a lot of changes. So like, for instance, you could be a student athlete walking down the street. This is how it used to be. You could be walking across campus and it's like pouring down rain or it's like it is now outside and it's eight degrees. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. You could be walking across campus and you couldn't accept a ride from just Joe Schmo off the street. Yeah. Shut up. No, that, yep. makes, that makes sense. That was a rule. Yeah. Like literally I could be. It's an assistance. Yeah. Now it's not so anymore. What about Uber? It could, it could be a benefit. As long as you're yeah. paying, then you're fine. So just as long as cash is in hand, as well, how as, do you prove as that? As long as you're not getting a free ride. Yeah. See, that's, that's why they got rid of I'm it. I'm right? surprised there's not like warfare between like colleges. Like, Hey, we're going to go to the unit. We're playing university of Tennessee tomorrow. Let's try to get. Let's try to. Why do you keep bringing up Tennessee, Spiker? Uh, Adam, it was the first thing. That you, okay, you mentioned it before the podcast. I mean, I, McDonald's, Tennessee. I don't know. Yeah. Something happened. But but anyways, like I'm surprised there's not warfare. Like we're playing Tennessee. We got to get this win. Let's go see if we can get a ride for yeah. their top quarterback. Yeah. That's what, I mean. That's why they got rid of them, right? And compliance officers were probably at the forefront of leading that because we can't track that. Right. Like I'm not spending eight hours of my day tracking if you get a ride or there used to be a rule about there could only be so much protein yep. in like a protein powder that you were allowed to have and it's like i can't track that no no way yeah i remember Stop. i remember when we got to talk about energy drinks like yeah. you couldn't have energy drinks oh, a I monster did. oh or anything there's still a limit on those yeah i know yeah, yeah. so we were playing salu and we're we're driving driving up and this red bull you know how they had the girls had the red bull car yeah uh-huh mm-hmm. So the Red Bull car saw that it had Missouri State on it, Missouri State Bears, and we're, we're driving into um, the stadium. The Red Bull girls followed the bus into the back, like past security, and they like whipped it around and sp- put their actual car in front of our bus. And one of our, our trainers goes, oh, hell no. Comes from the back of the bus and runs down the bus and just like chews these girls out and like, don't you can't do this and they literally kept on like like oh, we were coming off the bus yeah. yeah and the girls were still trying to pass it out and our trainer was trying to grab the energy drinks from our hands yeah to make sure that we weren't consuming the energy <laughs> yeah. drink well he was probably at that time he's probably looking out and just like he's probably had a run in with the ncaa or his compliance office oh, like man. there's a lot of education going on before that happened yep. for sure but yeah i mean they got rid of a lot of those rules, like I said, just because it's impossible to track that. Are, did they mean anything? No. Like, if you need a ride, get a ride. You know what I mean? Like, what was the photocopy thing? Like, what's same the- thing. It was just uh, it was perceived as an extra benefit, probably because regular students at your school because we had to pay for photocopies. Correct. And so, if you were getting a free one, it was a benefit. But again, they changed a lot of that. One, because it's hard to track. It's hard to monitor. And then two, making a photo, if you're making a photocopy as a student athlete, it's probably because you have to for a class. Right. Right. And so that's what I was thinking when I was like, I was like, this is so weird. Just because you're an athlete, you have access to that building. Normal students don't. You get it for free. They wouldn't. Right. But now it's like they, as long as you're doing things as a 
student athlete health, wellness, or an academic purpose, it's most likely going to be okay. And that's why they got rid of like the photocopy thing. I didn't know it was a rule, but like I said, it's something that I can't monitor. Um, it's something that even if they made me monitor, I'm probably not going to because I just can't. So it was just a like, ridiculous like, rule. Like, what, what son of a gun like made a photocopy and then loses his scholarship from that? Like yeah. I could only imagine, like, <clears throat> I wonder if there's ever been a person that's ever had that yeah. where they might, they were probably a little excessive on the warning. I don't think you would have lost your scholarship. It would have been a, Hey, little slap on the wrist. They probably would have. That's probably not a level one violation. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you're probably not ending up on the. That's cover that's of, not making ESPN. I can, no. just, I, can, exactly. I can just see that ESPN Spiker Helms takes photocopy, loses you're like hand, scholarship, hand, holding paper like this. <laughs> you could have, uh, could have. That might have worked out for you. You Could have got a sponsorship through like Xerox or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> but no, like I said, that's something that they got rid of. Okay, so we got the we got okay, so yeah. academic academic we got compliance. compliance. Yeah, what, what do we got else? Um, those are the two big ones, and everyone's important. Like, don't don't get me wrong, but as a student athlete, those are the two to take advantage of. I think the most. Um, but then you have your business um, department, so they're going to handle your budgets. They're working closely with the AD, um, and they're making sure that you're as an athletic department, you're under budget, you're bringing in money, you're bringing in revenue. They manage along with the compliance department. So um, their operations, basically. Mm-hmm. Basically, yeah. And they're managing scholarship budgets with the compliance department as well. Um, and then you have marketing, obviously. So everything you see, social media. Um, and that's a little bit of what you were talking about, sports information mm-hmm. and marketing. Mm-hmm. Those are two separate departments, um, but they work really, really closely together. Mm-hmm. Um, and how big are these departments? For It varies. So like it just depends on... like Getting a little bigger now. Yeah. yeah. I, get, I guess it depends on... I guess the CEO of the university, which would be the president, yeah. he's making those decisions on, okay, we're going to increase our marketing side for athletic department. It'd be the AD. Oh, it'd be the AD. Yeah. AD yeah. pretty much has free reign. So basically, cause he knows he has a budget inside of the correct. university. The way an athletic department works, at least in my experience is it's very, it's almost like its own company separate from the university. Um, the AD and the president are obviously working very, very close together. They have meetings, basically every week together but the athletic director has a ton of just free reign to kind of make decisions um on the fly so is their main goal to increase revenue for the athletic department or is their main goal to graduate athletes is it a combination of both like how do they view I guess it just depends on each athletic director. Right. I mean, it'll come down to philosophy of the athletic director. Um, And, you know, everybody's going to put out a statement where they want to graduate every student athlete. And I think they do. I mean, as an athletic department, you build a relationship with every student athlete that walks on your campus, or you should. Yeah. You know, and you want those people to succeed. Sure. You know, so I think it's a combination, right? you have to find a balance of we need to bring in the right players to succeed. So one, we can grow a fan base and have revenue coming in, right? Because we can't survive. We can't provide a service without revenue coming in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a huge thing is finding a way to make more revenue, how to sell more tickets, how to sell more merchandise. That's always at the front. Um, but at the same time, you know, if your student athletes aren't graduating, or they're not having success, well, then you're not going to get athletes to come there, you know? So it's a balance of... And I'm sure you get money from the state, too. If yeah, if you're a state school. Yeah, right. like a graduation, <clears throat> I mean, that's that's added money to the university. Right, and so that's a good point, is the NCAA has a ton of incentives to graduate athletes mm-hmm. to make sure they're meeting what's called progress towards degree and your graduation rates. Um, and again, that's a compliance area, is tracking your federal your graduation rate at your institution as compared to the federal graduation rate graduation rate and as compared to other institutions with their student athlete graduation rate because the higher you have those numbers the more money you're getting in so i know hike high school athletic departments like they have what if you donate money to the school or an athletic department you can't just donate to baseball or you can't just donate to football it's just a, it's literally a pot of money right. and then they end up dividing up the money. Mm-hmm. Right. So from like an athletic department standpoint, is that, I don't know if you can, if you can't talk about it, just say, I can't talk mm-hmm. about this. 
when you guys get revenue from like ticket sales or from sponsorships or anything like that, does that money then divide it amongst all the sports or is it okay? Football has football, football can donate to baseball and stuff like that. Or is it everything goes into one pool and then you guys decide mm, we're going to spend more money on baseball because baseball field is still literally playing in the city park. Right. Um, a little bit of a split. So ticket sales and things of that nature, revenue generating sports. So football and basketball typically are your two revenue generating sports at most colleges, Mm -hmm. right? Most other sports operate at a loss. Honestly. Um, I would say every other sport operates at a loss. So like your big revenue sports are going to be football, football, basketball, basketball. And then, you know, if you have, if you're a school where one other sports really big, let's say Vanderbilt baseball or or Arkansas baseball girls. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, then yeah, those will generate revenue too. Um, so it's almost like it's important for the athletic director to hire a really good coach that's able to do one recruit, get good athletes, but also market themselves. That's correct. Why Nick Saban makes eight million dollars a year. Yep. I mean, it makes him so po- it makes him valuable. Yep. Yep. And that's why Tim Corbin is Tim Corbin. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, like I said, most operate at a loss, so they're not going to be able to generate their own revenue. So yes, there is a lot of revenue sharing between football, basketball, and every other sport they have to divide that money up now they can take donations for football specific like if we have an outside donor who wants to give three million dollars to football only well that money's football only does it have to be does it have to be to a specific thing like okay i'm going to donate to the east side of the end zone or can i just give it to football and let nick saban decide how to spend the money yeah yeah you can i guess it goes from like the boosters right Correct. Yeah. yeah. They, at that point, you're considered a booster, whether you've officially signed up or not. Right. Um, but yeah, they can pretty much just give it, and then we get to use it however we want to for that sport. They can give it to the athletic or, or athletic department as a whole, and again, we're probably going to split that up, and we'll probably emphasize giving that to those sports that operate at a loss, um, just because it's free money. Did that have anything to do with like Title Nine? It does. It does. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And. That's a whole nother topic yeah. is Title IX um, and how to stay in compliance with that. But, yeah, you have to distribute money fairly equally. Yeah. Um, obviously, football is going to cost a lot more, so you can spend a lot more lot more money there mm-hmm. as compared to, let's say, tennis, okay, which doesn't really require that much money to operate. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a balance. But, yeah, it's a split, okay? I mean, it's like ticket sales and revenue from – A football game, yeah, that's going to get split between all sports. Do you guys talk about how, as a department, how to get a sport to be a revenue generator rather than a revenue loss? Or Uh, is that not really a concern? No, I mean, it's huge. Like, obviously, in an ideal world, they would all make their own money and be able to operate fully. Um, But that's, again, that's where those marketing and sports information departments come in because they're going to work closely to put on events that draw in people because they want to get more revenue for that sport. Like, let's say I'll just use SEMO baseball for an example. Mm -hmm. Okay. So SEMO baseball is lucky in a sense that they play in a city park, but Mm -hmm. it's split between the university and the city. Well, since it's not on university grounds, they've been able to, um, before now there's, they're loosening up the rules on like alcohol Mm -hmm. games. Mm -hmm. But before that you couldn't have alcohol on campus during athletic events. Well, because they were operating in the city, one of the biggest marketing um, events of the year was basically every Saturday home game we had, and sometimes Friday, they would bring in the local distributor. The marketing department would work with like the alcohol distributor in that area, and they would have free food, free beer, and it was packed. And then, so they're just basically trying to bring in more people to bring in more money for a sport baseball at that level, which is mid-major D1 that doesn't typically make a ton of money. So there's always events at every sport um, that they're trying to just bring in people because yeah, like it's a big emphasis to the more money, the better. I mean, it's a business. Do you think that baseball could end up being a revenue generating sport? Or do you think that it's like out of the question because just of the time frame that they're, they're required to play because I know there's been a lot of conversation before before the Cerveza sickness happened 
how to actually get it to be a revenue generating sport. Do you I, personally think that it's possible? I think it's possible. I think it's probably the first one in line outside of football and basketball, um, at least across the board. You know, like you said, UConn women's basketball is huge. Baylor women's basketball is huge. Um, but I think baseball is probably the one that could break through and become a revenue generating sport. Um, you're seeing um, the College World Series continue I mean, to continue to grow. That's huge. Right. That's like, I think that's one thing that is frustrating from a baseball perspective is that's one of the bigger events inside the NCAA. Obviously, March Madness is March Madness, and then obviously um, the football bowl series is what it is. Mm -hmm. But if you look at like super regionals and regionals, those are very popular um, amongst the colleges because, again, it's warmer weather. Mm -hmm. It Kids are out of school. Right. They're still there just kind of cleaning up and making sure that everything's settled and they're going to head to their internships. Mm -hmm. And then you have the College World Series, which is the final celebration. My, my question is, how can you duplicate that inside of the sport so that it ends up becoming like, hey, I'm, I'm a college I'm a college student. I'm in a part of fraternity. Let's let's go to a game. I think you are, though. I think you are. I mean, you look at the experiences like take SEC baseball. I mean, Kentucky just poured $60 million into their stadium. You think they're going to do that if fans aren't going to show up? Right. Um, of course they are. It, and, and it comes down to school size, honestly, because like like I said, your Vanderbilt, your Arkansas, you know, your bigger schools can pour more money into their facility to make it probably better than most minor league games. They can run events full, yep. full throttle. They have concessions. They like they can do everything then yeah, that'll be a reg revenue generating sport at that point because you're providing a top quality service for that community. Yep. Where the struggles come in are mid-major and down where they can't, they don't, they just don't have the personnel or the funds to put on something like that. To actually pull off a good event. <clears throat> Correct. And because so, like, like if you go to a Mizzou football or Mizzou baseball game, um, or even like when I was playing, we played Southern Miss the atmosphere yep. was so dynamic. Mm -hmm. It was way better than minor league baseball. Yes. It's just, it's at a different level than yep. I think even major league baseball. It's just a unique type of atmosphere. Yeah. And I mean, you both know this and I know this, what brings in fans winning, right? So that's where athletic directors got to take a good hard look. And if you're not winning, it's probably time to make a change with the coaching staff. You know, coaches play a huge role in that mm -hmm. because if, you aren't winning no matter what you're doing outside or in the stadium. Well, no one's showing up. No one's showing up, you know, so it's hard. It's a hard thing to do in college sports, especially, like I said, once you get outside of that power five conference, things drop off pretty dr drastically mm -hmm. in terms of revenue and in terms of um, facilities. So it's a hard thing to do for the majority of institutions is to make a sport outside of basketball and football to be revenue generating. So if you were an athletic director right now, just a good thought experiment, what would be your priority list to make? Obviously, let's talk about let's minus football and basketball. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's going to be where your main focus is. But if you were trying to create a baseball program that would generate revenue, what would be your priority list? Coach first. Coach I'd first. Bring in, I'd bring in a good coach. So would it be like a name brand, like a household name that you think would, I, would generate it? Or would it be like, I'm going to really audit and try to figure out who is the new cat in town that no yeah. one knows about yeah. that's going to just bring a buzz? I think, well, we'll just say that um, for the hypothetical that I'm not at a power five, right? I probably can't bring in a p big name head coach, you know? So I think a lot of it would come down to um, figuring out, knowing your personality and what, how he, your values operate and then trying to match those with a coach, right? Because if you're not on the same wavelength, chances are you're not going to get along. And if the AD and the head coach are not getting along in a sport, from my experience, typically doesn't work out well, whether that's on the field or in the office. Who usually wins that one? Oh, the AD. <laughs> the AD. <laughs> Just I mean, unless, the hammer. unless you're Nick Saban, then, it, then Nick Saban's winning that argument. But coach first, and then you really, in today's world, it, you have to have facilities. Like you just do, um, players today. It's all kids care about. Yeah, they're used to. And that's a big bill. That, it's huge. That number, like it's in the. I mean, you're spending it. Well, if just you thinking about it. what we want to try to do. Like just thinking sure. about those numbers. That I mean, I can only imagine what from a university standpoint. Like, all right, we want to build. You just said it, Kentucky. What was it? Sixty million, I think. 
you know, Okie State just put 80 into theirs or 100. And then that came That's from a ton. And that yeah. came from donators, like from boosters. That wasn't like we're I generating mean, it. From probably revenue. came a lot from football and basketball, to yeah, be quite true. honest. Yeah, to, I mean, yeah. to split. Yeah, they're going to split some of their revenues from those other sports and then donations. But I mean, today it's a lot of it comes down to facilities. It yeah. just, it just does. I mean, especially in baseball where in youth sports now, people are putting a lot of emphasis on facilities, right? Like you guys are doing it. I mean, Tigers are doing it um, wherever you go for a tournament. Well, bullpen. I mean, yeah, I mean, exactly. Huge, Grand Park. Yeah. Like Grand Park. It, that's what I had in mind. Like, it's, 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 getting it's, point, to it. it's getting to a point where like a kid goes to um, a pro, st- like from COVID, we were playing at a pro stadium every day. And now if we go to like the backfields of like Ellisville, they're going to be yeah, like, like right. what, what the is hell this? is this? Right. And that's not, that's <laughs> yeah. not a bad thing, right? Yeah. Like you're providing a better experience for yeah. sports. Like that's a good thing, but it desensitizes athletes, you know, because then you get to a college campus and they might not have the ability to have all turf and a huge indoor, like they just might not have that. And if a recruit comes on campus and sees that and they're used to having those things, well, doesn't, you, you it really doesn't out. matter if you win or not. You know, like, you know it's kind of funny because you hear this example all the time. Like, let's let's say you're a top 100 <laughs> high school baseball player, and you're obviously committed to a Power Five D1, but you're getting a lot of attention from the MLB draft. Well, a lot of guys, if you're not hitting a certain number, that decision is go to college because you get treated way better at college mm-hmm. than oh as a gosh. single A baseball when, player. When I went into, when I went, in, when I went into independent baseball, I was at. I was in the American Association, which is a good league. Like you have some MLB guys, AAA guys. Like I was a rookie, and I I was just amazed by how many how much talent there was. Like there were some World Series winners in there, mm-hmm. and everything. I was at the later end of their career, but the how they treated you was still very good, but it wasn't to the level of Missouri State. No, it it just baffled me. Like they it wasn't even close. Like our clubhouse was bigger. Our weight room was bigger. Our staff was bigger. Your meals were better. Your gear was better. Everything was better. You're staying in Hilton's. You're not staying at, um, a holiday Inn, uh, even though we want holiday Inn to sponsor us. We're still, we're still trying to get, we're trying to get that sponsorship. I just killed that sponsor. They're gonna be like, we're not sponsoring (laughs) you now. At some point, they're going to call. Yeah. <laughs> we keep on talking right. about it. Listen, I look forward to the holiday and stays whenever I was in college. So if that helps. You yeah. Know. But I mean, like from a, it's just, it's just odd, you know, like you go from, I'm, if I'm choosing power SEC baseball versus minor league baseball, that signing bonus has to be pretty high for me to make that decision. Sure. Yep. I'm not just signing for 20%. percent nope. Yeah. You get treated fantastic. And I mean, even, I mean, if we're being honest, like, yes, your LSU's, are going to have more gear and nicer stuff. But like, if we're being honest, if you're playing college ball somewhere, you're getting treated pretty well. Like you're getting, for the most part, you're getting cleats. Unless, you're getting unless you're in junior college, then oh. your, your clubhouse is your car. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was, I was fortunate. Mine was actually, they were pretty high on athletics there, but yeah, junior college is a whole different experience, but I will say, it builds a ton of character. Yep. Oh, like, it does. Like oh, you're yeah. playing in, you're doing double headers like, in two degrees, and yeah, four hour practice is nothing at that point. Like, like you're not that making. Was a, that was not, a good day. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's a good day. Like it, it definitely builds character. Like I highly recommend someone yep. going to junior college yep. rather than going because you got to get those innings first. Got to play more. Like I, uh, you're literally playing constantly, yeah. and you're getting so much better. It's better than that than sitting on the bench on a right. power five or a mid major mm-hmm. or even a D two to that matter. I think junior college is yeah. always a better route. 100%. I just always I always think it's funny though. Like someone would call me and like, Oh Spiker, where are you heading? I'm like, Oh, I'm heading to the clubhouse. And they're like, We have a clubhouse? I'm like, no, it's my car, car. bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and like not to get too off topic, but like we were talking about that the other day. Is like, you know, junior college guys, when they if you do go on after that, they're just different. Like coaches know that that's why they're so highly recruited. Yep. And as a player, if I had a junior college guy coming in or if I had a freshman coming in, guess who I could rely on more? Like, you know, I know what I'm getting with the yeah. Juco guy. Like they're gritty. They right, have to be. We're all Juco guys. Did yep. you guys think when you guys went to the four year university that those freshmen that's that went to the four year university were soft? Yes. Super. And they were lost. Like they had. They're, they were baby de- like deer. They had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. And like whether it's right or wrong, like I almost resented them a little bit because I was like, you guys have no idea. Like you're walking into all this gear, all this support, 
and it, I'm like, you have no idea what it's like to like grind, grind. Mm-hmm. Like, where That's you so have true. nothing. That is so true. Like, you'd be running. And it's not their fault. Yeah, it's not their fault. But, but I mean, like, you'd be you'd be running sprints, and you'd be wondering like, why is this guy acting like an absolute wuss right now? Yeah. Like, yeah. He's literally like bent over and about to throw up, and we've we're only in sprint number three. Right. And like to tie compliance into it, it's like when you go to a four year, it's like there's time limits on things. Mm-hmm. Right. You can only practice for so many hours a week i know I, that was like the biggest adjustment like, no but like i, I, but I like, walk on campus and then i'm like okay what, what time's practice and I'm like oh it, i think we start at like four and i was like we're not we're not going earlier yeah like no we're gonna start at four and i think practice will probably end at like six yeah or the fact that you I didn't even like, start <laughs> you didn't even start practicing with the team in fall until like a month and a half yeah. in you're like, I was like, you mean I don't have to shag fly balls for four hours, like as a pitcher? On the first day of school? Yeah. No. Juco, it's like, oh, we're going to start at noon, and uh, if you guys, you know, get your 27 hours in a row, then we're out of here. Well, that took six hours. Yeah, yeah. And so. the coach says, and if you piss me off, we're going to stay here for six more hours. Right. Because so, yeah, I can do just, whatever I want. You're welcome to my world, Grandma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But, no, it's just, it's different at a four-year, but... I think the third thing I would hire though is um, either tech or a really good support staff, meaning like strength or develop development would probably be the so you you dump a lot of money into the development side in terms of baseball, yeah, in most sports. I mean, I think that's why Iowa is so impressive because Iowa, is, like Rick Heller, is just on top of it. I I don't know what his budget is, but he is just raking in like stats and knows the ins and outs of mm-hmm. every single player, even his recruits. Like just being able to know what number works and then building off that number. Yeah. And I mean you guys are doing a, a ton with that right now, right? Mm-hmm. And even people you talk to, like it's just a data driven sport at this point. And sports across the board are becoming more like that if they aren't already. So I think in order to compete and to develop athletes, you have to make an investment there. Um, and then once you do make an investment, if you can prove to athletes coming in, like, hey, we took a guy who was six foot one, 150 pounds as a freshman, and he left here as a junior. He left early at six foot one, 215, and was throwing 93. You know, like if you can show athletes that, that's something that might overcome the facility thing. You know, if you're struggling facility wise, but you're developing guys, Mm -hmm. that's so true. You know, because like every guy has the dream, like I want to go to the show. Right. That's that's the dream. So if you're able to show that progress and be like, this is what I had the guy. He was running a seven flat sixty when he came in here, and now he's running a six six. Yep. And I think of I think of Iowa Western, the community college. Oh yeah. Right. You're going. You're. A lot of those guys are giving up four year options. Okay to go to a two year. Now they do have really nice facilities for a two year, but they're going to a two year because that staff has proven they can take guys from freshmen. And by the time they're a sophomore, they're either going to put you in a powerhouse four year or you potentially are drafted and they've consistently done that. So I think if you can show that you might be able to overcome the whole facility issue. So that'd be the third biggest thing to dump money into. So we went off two tangents. Yeah, now we, we got to get back onto the <laughs> yeah. main the main <laughs> topic at hand. Which well, I was, enjoyed my time as an athletic director, though. Yeah, yeah but, there, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Now Short we're going to re- do a quick retirement here. That's all right. Ta- we talked about the, diff- the the three parts of the department. We've got the academic, we've got the um, compliance, mm-hmm. and then sports information, marketing, Yep. and then business. Sorry, we have four. What, is there another area that we're missing, or are we done with the department? Um, You'll typically have a, it works with business, but you'll have a ticketing sales department. Um, just their jobs to put butts in the seats. Yep. Um, but that's another area. But again, they work closely. A lot of those all work super closely, like the sports information, the marketing, the business and ticket sales. That's might as well just be one giant area. But yeah, those are the typical um, options. And then you have a SWA, senior woman administrator. Um, that's a, that's a title nine thing as well mm. you have to have one of those um and they do a f- in my experience they do a fantastic job they're basically a second athletic director so when he's out doing what he needs to do you know kissing babies and shaking hands you know she's there to um make sure everything's running smoothly 
Gotcha. Now, Title IX, what, what's the requirements on Title IX? I don't oh, think a lot of people know that. There's a ton. I mean, like, it, it, when you hear Title IX, a lot of people are like, oh, Title yeah. IX. Or it's like, oh, Title IX. Yeah. No one really knows what it is, I feel like, for mm-hmm. the mass public. I mean, I just assume, like, oh, it's to get more women's sports. That's my assumption. Make it more fair. Yeah, yeah. make it more fair. Equality would be the yeah. biggest thing. Yeah. It's equality. E- equality. If you could sum it up in one word, it's just equality. And on that doesn't mean campus. just male and female. That means just equality in general. Correct. And that's not just athletics. I mean, that's institution-wide. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so there's, Title IX doesn't just go into sports. No. Now, most people think of sports, right? Because the big thing with Title IX when it was introduced is women's sports, right? But no, it's a campus-wide campus wide, um, rule that you have to follow. You have to meet certain thresholds. And again, it's it's a very, very, very broad topic that you can go deep down into. But if I can sum it up, it's equality. It's making sure that, okay, you have 12 men's sports. Okay, well, you can't have four women's sports. You know what I mean? Or oh, you're spending $2 million a year on men's sports. Why are you only spending $400,000 a year on women's sports? Like it, it's equality. Okay? What, was, there, was there a certain, because I knew that there, you had to have a certain amount of women's sports to men's sports, but wasn't it also a certain amount of women's athletes Correct. to men's athletes? Because yeah. like even specific from, from enough? What like, I, from what I've understood is football messes that all up because yes. a football roster you have, you could have a hundred dudes right. on is it. Is that why they're trying to do like, they're trying to make women's flag football a thing? And well, that's why they're always of, that's they're why they're always, always looking, looking for yes. a new new women's to sport try to, to get more like, athletes. Like yeah. rowing was huge for women mm-hmm. for a while. That's a huge and, that's a huge uh, like roster. Well, I mean, you're just looking for ways to do it because women don't have football. They don't mm-hmm. have a sport so have that to, can put out a hundred women athletes. That's why most institutions have more women's, women's sports, sports yeah. because football messes it all up. You have 120 yeah. athletes right there, and they're all male. Yeah. So, a lot of times it'll look like 10 male sports. 12 to 14 how does, women's the, how does the club side work with that because you have it has to be. i don't think i don't think people realize that you have the athletic like actual sanctioned sports mm-hmm. and then there's another stem off of the university which is club sports unless they're getting funding from the athletics department they don't count towards okay. the athletics title nine requirements but the university recognizes them and says that they can wear their logos and branding. correct mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's, that's an why. institution not an athletic funded event club team would that be considered like recreational sports then basically basically. rec sports rec sports your recreation department is typically who runs those which is completely separate from athletics oh really yeah so your rec your recreation so most campuses will have like a rec center Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. they control all of your rec sports they control a lot of your club activities they do their own funding that's why i find weird with like so example missouri state has a really good hockey program but it's a club program and they have a pretty good coach and like it's built out they they get fans mm-hmm. it's a thing mm-hmm. they've yeah. never been able to be a sanctioned sport and they play is it men or women's it's men's oh probably title That's nine probably because if they accept that which it sounds like would be a smart move because if they're getting fans there's money right mm-hmm. so it might be a good idea to incorporate them but then you have to, add you have to find an, oh, yeah, you're another adding, two women's sports so you're adding so you're essentially to, so two basically teams. you're back channeling that yeah. And so any revenue you would make from that hockey team is basically going to fund another team. So you're br- either breaking even or there's another loss. Mm-hmm. So and they, that's not to say women's can, sports don't can, draw money because now, a lot athletic, of them do. Can athletic departments counsel the recreational department, or are they tra- <laughs> uh, is there like a complete dividing line there? Like we have to keep these guys separate. Um, I don't know if there's like a bright line rule that says you have to. In my experience. The only time we worked really close with them was facility usage. Like, hey, it's snowing outside. Our track team needs to run. Can we use the indoor track at the rec center? And like, yeah, it's open three to five. Okay, we relay that to our coaches. Outside of that, we didn't work super close. At least I didn't with our rec staff at all. And so now we're getting to a point where it hasn't always <clears throat> been this way, where recreational sports are now playing different universities. Has that always been a thing? I feel like that's like new. It was that way when I was in college, so twenty, at least twenty thirteen. Okay, it was that um, way when we played. Really? Mm-hmm. So the, these. I think guys it depends are... on the size of your school again. Okay. Like I'm sure, you know, I'm sure I don't know North Carolina. They probably have a badass soccer club team that goes and plays 
Stanford yeah, soccer yeah. club. Yeah, I mean, there's team. baseball you clubs, know? and there's, yeah. like, we had rugby at Missouri S&T, and they'd go play Mizzou because it was a club sport and things of that nature. And, like, it's a real deal. Like, they, yeah. they, they it's yeah. highly competitive. Yeah, it's yeah. a real sport. I mean, they have the logo and everything. Yeah. It's just they can't sanction it. Right. We had two or three guys come from the club team at SEMO playing baseball. They walked on the baseball team, like, funded from the athletic department. The actual, I hate to say actual, they're both baseball teams. The sponsored. <laughs> There's gonna be a person that played for like the club. Yeah, they're gonna so hear like, this. Oh, we could have you son of. A, we could have. We could have. They're we gonna be so beat mad, your but. team. Like my team was so much better than your sanctioned team. <laughs> yeah, but no, they walked on. So yeah. like, yeah, there is some crossover there, but they're separate. They're separate entities. Yeah. Got you. Okay, and then do like they hire a coach? Like, is it? For, it's player manager. Yeah, it's probably it's more player. Mister uh, Mister Coach Player Sir. The the senior yeah. and the frat. So it's kind of like Pete Rose, like being the player manager for like the what was he Cincinnati Reds or Phillies? Yeah, just like weird, like player coach. Like I, if you get an argument with him on the field, like all right, you're benched for like two days. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like what Yadier Molina is to the Cardinals. Yeah, he's like out there on the field and he's coaching at the same time. So yeah, he's like a third, fourth, fifth coach. <laughs> yeah, but I mean coach. to be to be clear, just in case anybody listens to this and they get mad, like your rec teams, so your frats and yep. That's different from club teams. Club teams typically get like one jersey and they're they get funding, mm-hmm. whereas rec sports are just sign up and create a team. Yep. So those things are different. So they're okay. basically like three separate. You have athletics, club, and then rec. So okay, so there's like three layers Correct. to the university yeah. when yeah. it comes to sports. Yep, okay, typically that makes sense. Now, I find it interesting with um, counselors in high school because you have really good counselors. And then you have some counselors that just aren't, I would say, athletic centric. Yep. They they give recommendations that might not be the right recommendations. Um, I mean, I've I've heard stories where it's like um, an Ivy League school um, is recruiting somebody, and then the person says, "Well, they're not going to be able to give you like example wa- um, University of Washington um, or WashU." Yeah, St. Louis, Washington University. Yeah, one one of the best schools, mm-hmm. arguably three, throughout the world. Academic, like university. it's yeah. it's yep. very very good. Ridiculous, and they give recommendations that you shouldn't go there because you're not going to get a scholarship. But then a mid major comes in and they offer you forty percent. Mm-hmm. It's a no brainer. I'm going to Wash U. Like mm-hmm. my my I'm literally set for life. Correct. When it go if I go to Wash U instead right. of going to a mid major D one school. Yeah, it, not a question. My question is, is that how do you how do you think about it from being in the university standpoint, like a, a recommendation for athletes that are now in high school? How should they approach to get like during the recruiting process? Um, it's a good thing you brought this up because I really wanted to hit on this. Um, if you're a high school athlete or you're a parent of a high school athlete, like this is a part that I would definitely listen to is. So we talked about the eligibility. I hit on the eligibility center earlier. Right, so it used to be called the Clearinghouse. It's mm-hmm. now the Eligibility Center. So, because Clearinghouse got people con- completely confused. Right. Because like, so, what did that actually mean? I have no idea. That's before my time. <laughs> no one knew. You, you just knew you had to do it. Well, yeah. my compli- So I'm at Borgia, right? And the compliance officer, like uh, our advisor, told me, "Oh, did you sign up for the Clearinghouse?" And I'm like, "What's the Clearinghouse?" And he's like, "Oh, it's this thing." And like, he, it was so confusing. Yep. I was like, well, how do I do this? He like gave me no guidance whatsoever. Yeah. So that's a compliance person's job. Should be. Okay, so if you're a high school athlete, one thing that you need to do, regardless of if you have a really good counselor or not, and if you have a really good counselor, the chances are they're probably already on you about this. If you think you're going to want to play sports in college, you should sign up with the eligibility center when you're like a sophomore, if not a freshman. Yep. Because so the eligibility center essentially to give everybody kind of a brief rundown is it allows the NCAA, the institutions that you potentially want to go to or that you end up at a big database of information. It's the NCAA's way of saying, here, fill this all out so that we know that you're eligible. And then your guidance counselor and your school are going to put in your test scores, your grades, because to be eligible for college sport, you have to meet the grades beforehand right you have certain amount of core classes and right. everything else and each high school is different yeah. yeah you have to have 16 core classes and like you said it varies drastically from high school to high yep. school um 
And so there are requirements that you have to meet and they differ D1, D2, D3, but there's always requirements no matter what level you go into. And those high school counselors are there to assist you and to make sure your grades are getting in there. Now, if you don't have a good one, what you need to do is you need to be very proactive. And I think you should be proactive with that regardless. Make that account your freshman, sophomore year. And then once you start getting to your junior year, you need to be checking that almost, I would say minimum once a month. Just hop on there because it's gonna blast you notices on your profile. Like, hey, you need to do this. Hey, requesting your amateurism is open now. You should fill that out. Okay, so then if you get on there, you see those, okay, I fill it out. Because the worst thing that can happen and it'll drive your compliance office nuts is it's the summer before you're getting on campus and you don't have a single thing done. So they, have to, I, they then, have to get that <clears throat> box done. Correct. I have to get it done. So either I have to reach out to your counselor in high school or you have to do it. You know, so it's just get in there, get that stuff done, um, stay up to date with it. And then one other thing is let your counselors know ahead of time that yep. you're thinking about college sports because then they can figure out what your school's core classes are to make exactly. sure that you are meeting those because there's nothing worse and we've had it happen multiple times is and it typically happens in smaller schools i went to a small high school i didn't know any of this stuff in a lot of cases it's smaller schools and what happens is it's their senior year they have decent grades mm -hmm. but they are at 11 of 16 core classes because certain classes just don't count. They, yeah, they just they, don't count they, towards it. They don't count yeah, towards they, it. Yeah, and the NCAA approves all of those. So the high school sends off their curriculum, and then the NCAA approves which ones meet it and which ones don't. Um, and so the last thing you want to do is get to your senior year, and yep. I'm short five core classes. Yep. Like, that's devastating. Now I'm taking now you summer can, classes, and right, I'm doing this. You can this get there, but you're going to be taking three summer classes, yep. and it's going to be a pain. Yep. And it, you're probably paying for that out of pocket, yep. potentially. So make sure that your counselors know, one, what the eligibility center is, two, that you want to play college sports, and then three, follow up with them to make sure that you are in classes that are going to meet those requirements. And then, like I said, continuously check that. And as you start to get recruited, check it even more, twice a month. That, that's why it's super important, like you said, freshman, sophomore year. Yeah, just register. And you're not going to do almost anything your freshman, sophomore year with mm -hmm. it at all. No. Um, but once you start getting late into sophomore year, junior year, you need to be on there at least once a month. And then, like I said, just gently remind your counselor, like, hey, you know, I'm a junior. Schools are starting to reach out. Just want to make sure that everything's good. I'm in the right classes, um, that you guys are uploading it. Could you maybe upload last semester's transcripts for me? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Obviously, it needs to be the ownership of the player to get that stuff done. But you only know what you know, right? Yeah. Do you think that a guidance counselor should meet with all of the athletes in a high school to explain this? I would recommend it. And I wish, and like, they're starting to do a better job, but I wish the NCAA would do a better job of that, yeah. the outreach to high schools. Because, like, again, I've had really good counselors, mm -hmm. and I've also had really bad counselors. Mm -hmm. And I remember one gal from Borgia that was just phenomenal. She was just an awesome, awesome person. Then I had another one that literally didn't tell me anything and I got transferred to him. Yeah. And I had no idea. I was literally like lost yeah. and I had to do everything my senior year and it was miserable. Right. So you recommend that from a counselor standpoint, they need to take a proactive approach. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously it's hard because only 7% of athletes are going to play college sports. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be better to just literally blanket the whole group because then you're naturally going to have fallout but then you're going to grab those people and they're all on the same page. Yeah. What I would recommend, and we did this with college athletes, you corral team by team in the high school's case. It's probably, depending on how big your high school is, set a time, whether it's Tuesday afternoon at four o'clock, we're all meeting in a computer lab or a place that has a ton of computers, right? Set them down their sophomore year and just say, hey, you guys are athletes. If you know you're going to college or if you don't, let's just log on and create an account. Now, the account you're going to need to be certified costs money. Um, I think it's like 60 bucks, mm -hmm. something like that, 60, yep. $70. But there is just a basic registration account. So I think high school counselors should mandate that if you're playing sports, we're going to meet and you're at least going to sign up for that. 
registration account. It's completely free. Let's just knock it out at one time. Let's go over just the very bare essentials of what you need to do the next three years if you want to play college sports. So it's almost like you have to do like initial meeting to explain to all the sports and then have a secondary meeting and say, all right, we're going to meet in the computer lab, bring your 60 bucks or credit card or whatever, and then let's get this knocked out. Correct. Jared, is is there a difference? So say I'm student A who I'm going to go try to play baseball at Mizzou and I'm student B, I'm just going to go be a journalism major at Mizzou. I mean, there's common core classes for just general admissions. Is there a difference in terms of athletic admissions than general admissions or to be eligible for scholarships or how does that work? Yeah. um, It'll vary. So the institution side is going to vary institution, institution, right? What you have to do now, they're mostly the same. You got to have, I don't know. I don't know what they are. Like you have to have three approved math courses, three science, science, you know, and athletic typically is, very similar to those now there is some differences you have to meet like i said 16 core classes Mm -hmm. um you have to have like four english three math two science two natural sciences and then like four other ones which might be a spanish or something like that okay your main institution's admissions might not have all of those requirements and they sure as heck aren't going to have a list of specific exact classes that you're limited to um, they might, but it's not going to be as restrictive. Sure. So yes, um, you know, it's much easier most of the times, unless you're going to a wash U or something like that. Most of the time it's easier to meet the school's admissions criteria than it is the NCAAs. Got it. So again, working with guidance counselors. And like you said, not every guidance can, it's not like they take a course on this and no, like, hey, this is how it's a the very NCAA hard works. job. Like, it if is. you think about it, they have a ton to and, deal and with. I don't want to like bash on counselors. I've just been giving you guys examples of like what I've been through. Yeah. But it is a very difficult job because you have, if you're at a small school like mine, there was 500 students. You have 500 souls that you're trying to figure out and try to get them past high school and try to get them to. You're guiding them. Yeah. On what what major do you want? Right. And literally talking to a high school person on how to what what do you want to do what, for your degree yeah. what do you like, want out of life yeah like that's a that's a, i mean i still don't know what i want to do with my life right yeah, exactly and, and i feel like education on from a compliance office mm. and talking to the counselors from the nca down because they only know what they know right and if you're able to deliver they're like hey this is our pain points mm. if we if you guys can solve this it'll help uh, help the process a lot better right and i again you know, that might start with high school principals. It might start Mm -hmm. with the vice principals. Guidance counselors have a ton on their plate. Like you said, they're trying to graduate people. They might have students who have a lot deeper issues than potentially playing college sports, right? I'm sure it's one of the last things on their list. So that gets back to the proactive side. You know, if you're an athlete and you were thinking about it, you don't got to be rude with it, but just remind them like, hey, could you please, you know, upload my transcripts or just want to check in with you, make sure I'm all good. You know, so just be proactive. But yeah, schools should. Which again, it starts with this podcast. I mean, and I bet you a bunch of people were listening to this and they're like, I had no idea we yeah. had to do that. That's crazy. Yeah. And it's super simple. It's just a matter of actually doing it. Like the eligibility center, I will say, you know, the NCAA doesn't always get things right, in my opinion, but they have a fantastic eligibility center. Like it's super user friendly. You log in and if you have something to do, it's going to literally smack you in the face across the screen. Right. So. Just make sure you're staying on top of that. So the original idea when asking you to come on to and podcasting this was I had a situation with one of our players that had a, he had a really good question. Like it, mm-hmm. it was, it was a phenomenal question and I wanted to make sure that it, I was answering it correctly. Cause like in my head I was like, Oh, that's a, that's an easy answer. Like you just, don't, don't worry about it. It's fine. And I started thinking about, I was like, man, what happens if I'm that guy that ends up giving him the wrong answer. And then like three years later, the NCAA slaps him and he can't play sports anymore. Yeah. That I would feel miserable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, this scenario came up and I want you to run through the scenario. And I, you did a really good job on the phone with me um, talking about one of your athletes that did like an Olymp- was doing the Olympic trials. Mm-hmm. So the athlete for everyone that's listening, got just got invited to a really prestigious event um, for perfect game. And they were looking for ideas to find ways to get him down to that event and reduce out of pocket costs. And so they ran um, a GoFundMe 
and obviously family, friends, public can end up going on GoFundMe and literally give them the funds to go to the event. Mm -hmm. And you had a really good answer. Like I asked, can he do that? Will this bite him in the butt later on down the road? Go through the scenario and how you would handle that. Um, so it is tricky and, but short answer is he can do it. Short answer is he can, he can do it. There are just, as with everything with the NCA, there are a lot of loopholes that you need to be aware, not loopholes. That's not the right, correct term, but there's just a lot of things you need to be aware of. The best thing you can do is playing field. You got to know the playing field. You got to know the rules. Correct. And so before you ever do anything as an athlete, double check, double check. Okay, mm-hmm. whether that's reaching out with you guys like he did, which was fantastic. Um, if you are potentially getting recruited, check with your school compliance office first. But so the situation was, like you said, he needed assistance, right? The short answer is yes, but there are some restrictions, right? So the NCA and I pulled it up, um, the language they use is actual and necessary expenses. So this is pre-college enrollment. You're not out of school yet. You can have friends and family. Um, family is the better option. If you can keep it family only, it's just safer. It is. Um, but they can pay for your actual and necessary expenses. So what it costs to enter into that event. Okay. So they can pay for what it costs for that registration for, um, the travel to get there. Okay. If it's relating to that event, yes, it can probably be covered. Now you need to cap it. Okay. So if it costs $575, let's just say for instance, I don't know where I got that number, but if it costs $575, once you hit that amount, you can't accept anymore because then you're accepting over the actual and expenses. you're technically getting paid to play. Then you're because crossing over into, you're accepting money to go play. You're making a profit. It, it attacks point. your amateur status correct and the last thing you want to do as a high school athlete is do something that jeopardizes your amateurism status because you're either going to lose a year you only Mm -hmm. get four you're going to lose a year of college eligibility or if it's serious enough you just won't have any okay and then you're out of options so anytime you're accepting funds be very 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 cautious um can, can you define real quick what, what amateurism is or what amateur status is for people that don't Yeah, know? basically, they, the NCAA wants to make sure very, at the most general level, the NCAA wants to make sure that you have never been a prof- professional. And they define professional as you're getting paid, you're getting some kind of benefit, whether it's a sponsorship or gear or a meal. A car a, ride, yeah. A photo, uh, photo <laughs> copy. <Photocopy. laughs> yeah. A a single meal probably wouldn't cross you over that, but like if you're, like, let's just say for instance, your AAU coach. Let's go to basketball. If your AAU coach is paying your rent so that you play on his team, you're a professional. What happens if the player stays with you? What do you mean? Oh, stays with you, like as a. You need to be a little cautious there too. Because then they're feeding you, yes. they're housing you. Yeah. So we've had that issue in my very short two years. Like well, that was we, the whole Michael Orr situation. Yeah. And they're like, like I said, it's all these things are going to depend situation to situation. Like there's no, with NCAA rules, there's really no bright line rule. Here's how you do it. Here's mm-hmm. how you don't do it. Like it depends it's on the epit- that exact situation. It's the epitome of a Pandora's box. Yeah. Like every single situation yeah. is a Pandora, Pandora box. Yeah. It's tricky. I mean, the smallest things that you don't even think of can cross over into that. Um, but the amateurism thing is just make sure you're not getting paid in any way to mm-hmm. go play for, you know, your sport to go play baseball. Make sure you're the Rawlings Tigers aren't paying you to right. play. Right. That'd be number one. Um, but it gets tricky when it gets into, you know, taking money to go play in that event, right? Mm -hmm. You just have to make sure that you're doing it properly. Accept it only from family if you can. Only accept the amount necessary. Um, stay away from people that you know give money to universities. Like, Spiker, if you give 
from a donator to Missouri State yeah. baseball. Yeah. Let's just say, yeah. and I know Missouri State's going to go to that event. Don't then, accept money from you. Would be my. Do you remember the whole Miami football deal back in the uh, was it early two thousands? What happened there with uh, Neville Shapiro? Uh-huh. Oh, so yeah. So yeah, yeah. he was, I think that was his name, but he was a big booster and like a I mean, well off guy. I think he was into finance and he loved Miami football. Miami football was really good back in those days. And you'd always see, I think it's Neville, but anyway, you'd always see him like, you know, the smoke that they'd run out of. Well, he'd always be standing right there on that field with the Miami football jersey on. And then, he, long story short, he was into the Miami like night scene, wanted to have the players out with him, so he was giving them all kinds of improper benefits, basically treating them. The whole story was, because they did a 30 for 30 series on ESPN, the Miami University football players were being bigger celebrities and being treated better than the Miami Dolphins football players who were professional <laughs> yeah. in that area. Yeah. Like it, was a, it was a bigger deal to be a, a hurricane than a dolphin. Yeah. And so they were just they were accepting all kinds and they, of improper benefits get the death and like SMU like nope. SMU got the death sentence. Nope. And they uh, yeah. So long story short, he was he was doing it to become more popular, be, be in the in crowd, giving them money, giving them shoes, giving them this that whatever, all kinds of you know club money stuff like that. And it was uh, obviously that that was against amateurism status. Correct. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a that's a big one right there. Yep. But it, it, small things can cross you over. Um, so I've hit on a couple things, you know, just be careful with what you're accepting and how the situation we had was we had a gymnast at SEMO who, who was invited to perform for like the Canada national team in this international event. Right. But she didn't have the money and they weren't paying her to do it. They couldn't pay her to do it. Mm-hmm. So we had to set up a GoFundMe, and we couldn't use, it's, it's a very tricky thing to do. We couldn't use her n- name or status as a student athlete to raise that funds. So it's kind of like, hey, here's a random GoFundMe. Um, help out if you can. Mm-hmm. And then we have to track, you know, who donates to that. Now, it's a little different because she was at, at the time a college athlete. Um, but if you're a high school player and that situation happens where you need some funds, keep track of who gives you money is one thing. I would just make sure you're keeping track of it and then make sure it's only, only being used for what it actually costs to attend that event. And then cap it. And if you somehow accidentally get more, if you cross over, it's, if it's five seventy five and you get seven hundred dollars, try to figure out who was the last to donate or and give it back. Give it back. Yeah. What's the difference between that and can you do like a fundraising event where you transfer like a T shirt or something? Like you give something. You Would, could. Does that does that but help again, negate that? It, you could, but again, it you have to be careful because you can't at this time. You can't use your status as, hey, an I'm a really good athlete. Help oh, me. and use your brand. Mm-hmm. Like, I couldn't put my face on there and be like, hey, here's some T-shirts. Uh, because because why isn't Steve, who's going to school as a math major, he's really, really smart, really good at math, but he's not getting benefits as being a math major. Exactly. I mean, I'm a big fan of Steve. I hey, I love it. I think Steve's going to be do really well in life. Smarter than me. <laughs> but, but, yeah, like, you couldn't, like, just make some random T-shirt, whatever you put yeah. on it, and then put out posters that says, you know, like, Spiker Helms, Missouri State baseball player, selling, you know, you can't do or that. Or come to the party. Yeah, like, hey, buy this shirt because I'm an athlete, you know, because you're an athlete. you got to stay away from anything to do with your athletics involvement. If you can fundraise by going and buying mm-hmm. a bulk thing at Snickers bars and just selling them out, yeah, go for it, you know, but be very careful about using your status as an athlete or – what you do as an athlete on the field to raise money off topic. But can you imagine how difficult it was for like LeBron James when he was a senior in high school, knowing that he was going to make millions of dollars. You Can you imagine how many people were coming over to him talking about endorsements, this endorsements that well, they're, they're in arenas. Yeah. Yeah. Like think about all the sports agents. Like they're like hawks. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's another topic. You got to like vet your friends. You got to vet your family. You got to vet all these people. Cause even if they take ben- if they take benefits, right, that affects you. Yeah. So if they're accepting benefits on your behalf or if they're profiting off of what you're doing, it can, yeah. that can cross you over. That's like, I didn't even do anything wrestling. wrong. Just like, because I mean, then they're technically in the NCAA's eyes, they're an agent. You don't have to be licensed as an agent. Yep. You don't have to go to law school to be an agent in the NCAA's eyes. If you're accepting money or bargaining yep. on behalf of, student Jimmy over here, you know, if you're taking money because you're associated with him, you are an agent. 
at that point. How do brands, because they get those deals pretty early. So like Shaquille O'Neal's deal when he comes out of the out of college LSU, Michael Jordan with North Carolina, like they were the like minute he signs. That's yep. when they can start negotiations. They can't start negotiations before that. But they could, but so what we did with our football player, we had a football player whenever I was at SEMA who was drafted by the Cleveland Browns. As soon as his last game was over and he knew he was not coming back, he could go talk to an agent. That's him it didn't de- have to that's be before him declaring, signed. though, right? That's the same thing. Like, but it can't be before that. It wouldn't necessarily be officially declaring, but as soon as he talks to that agent, his college status is done. Like, as soon as you start dealing gotcha. with an agent, you are signing, hypothetically signing the papers, saying, yeah. I am Got done. It. Because if it gets found out that you're dealing with an agent, like, yeah, that's your eligibility that's gone. Do now, agents try to work around that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the NCAA now. Um, recently, within the last couple of years, they've only done it for basketball, but I probably see them going towards it, towards all sports in the future, is you can work with an agent prior to officially declaring for the NBA draft, but there are a lot of restrictions, and that agent has to go through the NCAA's own certification process. So they have to be certified by the NCAA. Let me guess, that costs money. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> money in the NCAA. I can't imagine. Yeah, I would. I will say this: if chances are, like, let's just say, high school baseball player, because you can get drafted out of high school, right? I'll throw this out there: if you're good enough to be drafted as a high school baseball athlete, chances are you probably are going to school somewhere, have offers somewhere. Mm-hmm. Before you talk to an agent or sign with an agent or even get into dealings with an agent, I would contact your school. Get in touch they with don't their, call them agents, so they call them advisors. Same thing. Advisors, agent, friend. <laughs> yeah, like a, a guy, <laughs> a guy texts Jimmy, hey, I'm, I'm with blah, blah, blah. I'm an advisor. Yeah. Advisor, agent, friend who's making me money. There's, 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 it's yeah. the same thing in the yeah. NCAA's eyes. So chances are if you find yourself in that spot, you're probably playing college ball or have a chance to. Mm-hmm. Contact your compliance office. What they're going to want to do is either tell you – they're not going to tell you not to meet with him because – you know, there's a chance you could make good money mm-hmm. out of high school, but they're probably going to want to sit in on the meeting. We always tell our guys and gals at SEMO is like, if you get contacted by an agent before you do anything, let us know. And we can sit down and talk, but we physically, either the AD or the compliance officer has to be involved at that, in, like at that conversation. Mm-hmm. It can't be a one-on-one with just you and the agent. I could see how that could be like a problem for an athlete because then you don't know who to trust. Like this guy over here is offering me probably like big dollars. Like why would I want to come to you and like tell me how to handle the situation? Like that'd be super tough as me as an athlete. Like, like you're trying to prevent me from making money. Yeah. And that's where, how do you convince someone to say like, I have the, I have your best interest. Like, yes, I work for the university, but trust me, I have better interest than this guy because he's just mm-hmm. trying to make money off you. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like any other business or team. How do you get your teammates to follow along? You got to build a relationship first, right? So as a compliance officer, it's really tough because like we said when we first started, you walk into a room and you're not everybody's favorite person you're to the see. Bad, yeah. But like it's your job to build a relationship with those student athletes. And oftentimes we do because we see them a lot. Once you have that relationship and that trust and you relay to them that, hey, listen, I'm not trying to jip you out of $500,000 right now, but I want to make sure that you don't sign something that you don't know what you're getting into or that you don't know could end your college career right now, you know, because it has happened where people talk with an agent multiple times, the agent backs out at the last second, but they've already committed and now... They can't play college ball anymore, and they've lost a chance to sign with an agent who could make them in pro ball, so they're in limbo and you're out of options. So we try to relay that to athletes. It's like, listen, I'm not there to stop you, but I'm there to just make sure that, hey, if you back out, if you sign or if you continue talking with them right now and something goes wrong, you've just cut yourself off from college. So it's just making sure that they know those fine lines. Cause I mean, a hungry agent is going to play that FOMO game with them. Yeah. Which is tough. Yeah. 
and that's not out to like vilify agents, you know, but like there are some, I mean, there's some really good agents out there. Some I'm very talk, good I've agents. talked to some really class acts, but then there, but, I mean, if you're a guy that's first starting out and you're taking again, risks, it's a cutthroat. You're, industry. Yeah. Yes. You're taking risks. I want to make my dough. I want to be the next Boris. Mm-hmm. I got to make a move. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, and it's not, like I said, it's not always agents. You know, it happens a ton in basketball with AAU. There's some shady stuff that goes on in AAU basketball where, you know, maybe you do come from a harder upbringing, right? And all of a sudden that money looks real good and you have your uncle over there who's not an agent who works down at the local shipping yard or mm-hmm. whatever, and but he's negotiating on your behalf. Well, right there you go. Like he's an agent at that point, you know, so it's just tricky. How do you handle the social media aspect? Because if, because me, I'm more entrepreneurial, right? Um, and if I was more entrepreneurial inside of sports, like I, I, I wasn't really totally focused, hyper focused on baseball, which I was. But if I had like this inkling of developing like a business out, outside of my athletic career, how do you handle that from a social media standpoint? Because like these kids are building brands, yeah. and like if I'm an influencer, I can make some pretty good dough right off the bat. I can either go sponsorship or I could sell baseball cards. I could sell shoes. I could, if I'm good at graphic design, I could sell something that deals with graphic design. Mm-hmm. How does, how do you approach that? I think the last time I checked Trevor Lawrence had like 600,000 followers or more as an athlete. So this is a huge, huge topic of discussion right now. Um, and it has been for several years. And it could be attractive for a university to bring that person in too. Yeah. So the way I'll start with the way it is now, the rules now around that, um, when these will change, I have no idea, but right now you can have whatever business you want as a student athlete. If, if it does not involve you using your name, image, or likeness, or status as a college athlete. <laughs> so, basically, you're so not allowed. Basically, basically, you can't do it. Yeah. So we'll say that you can, but technically, yes. So, sorry. social media. Why do you have those followers? Because your name's on it. They know that you are the starting quarterback at Clemson, and that's why they follow you. That's why you have your status. And if you wanted, if Trevor Lawrence wanted to get on there and post an ad with, I don't know, like Gatorade. He's holding a Gatorade bottle. says, I drink Gatorade before every game. Can't do it. Well, even subliminal messaging. Yeah. How does the NCAA know that? Like, I use, let's just say, I drink Gatorade. That's my brand. I'm drinking Gatorade. As long as it's not a clear promotion. And I don't want that to come across. I don't want people to think, oh, now I can get away with it. Yeah, I don't want that to be the case. But like, if I just randomly take a picture and I'm wearing an Under Armour polo, right? If I just take a picture and post it on Instagram and I'm wearing an Under Armour polo, that's fine. Like I'm not promoting it. Mm -hmm. But what happens if you keep wearing that over and over again? Does that raise a red flag or does that mean this this kid likes Under Armour? I think it would raise a red flag to investigate it a little bit. And again, it's all going to come down to context. Because because you know how some people are. There's some people that are just die die hard. hard. Like I'm a die hard Apple fan. I love Apple products. And, and whenever I post a video, you'll, you might see me with my uh, iPhone or with my computer. Mm-hmm. I, I have a lot of Apple products, even my AirPods. I just I think, love that brand. I think if it's incidental, no big deal, right? But it's a tough, tough, tough area. And w- my last year, this was the number one violation that we had. And we reiterated it to athletes non stop like hey you can't use your social media account your personal social media account that's connected to you know your status and who you are as a person to sell stuff like we had a soccer player who started a very good business she was reselling and she still does it now and she's done but she was basically thrifting for clothes um so she was flipping it yeah but she would also change them, create them. She knew how to sew. She was doing things. So she was creating her own clothing mm-hmm. line, but she had the link to the website on her Instagram profile. She would take pictures with herself and other student athletes in the clothes, tagging the clothing website. Mm-hmm. 
And that right there is a violation. I mean, there's another layer to this. Like, so let's just say she does. Okay. I can't use my personal social media. I get it. So she starts an account for her new, mm-hmm. so her, her clothing brand. What happens if she, she's the owner and operator of that business and she uses herself as the model because that's the only way you can do that as a solo entrepreneur, you have to literally do everything you possibly can to get the brand out. Yeah. So that's what she ended up doing. We had to set up with some caveats. So we had to set up her own Instagram page, which she already had it, but she had to remove anything from her personal that connected to that business. And then when it comes down to posting, so for her case, it was closed, right? When it came down to making content for that website, she couldn't use like face up. Like it couldn't be, you couldn't know it was her wearing the clothes. Now what happens if she puts a picture of herself on her Instagram? She says, okay, I get it. And then she accidentally like, you know how it is. Like you're out at the beach having fun with your teammates and you're wearing your clothing brand. Just can't tag it. Mm-mm. Well, you can't tag the business or I can't can, tag the business, but now, I can still could, wear it. She could wear it as long as it's not in the comments like, oh, I got this from such and such website or, but I could have the big brand name here. Like as long as Betty's as, shirts as yeah, as long as you're not blatantly promoting that item. Like if you just happen to be wearing it, sure. A lot of gray area. There's a ton. And, so and I can't this, say like, oh, I got this new shirt. From, exactly. And this is mm. why compliance officers struggle so, so much with this, like social media there's so many rules around social media that like we talked about with some of the other rules, they are nearly impossible to track and they are nearly impossible to enforce because there's just so many of them, you know, like there's just so many instances, like what crosses the line? What doesn't? Okay. Even if it does cross a line, how am I going to find out about it? Like I, I'm not going to spend six hours of my time scrolling through student athletes, social media feeds. Like I don't have that kind of time. Like Mm-mm. we're busy people, you know, Unless you have a staff of 60 compliance officers, it's just not possible. So that's what there's a lot of advocating on behalf of compliance officers to DNC. Be like, listen, we need to figure something out. And this is a national debate because this gets into NIL, so name, image, likeness. And it's a hot, hot topic. It's been a hot topic in college athletics within just athletics for a long time. And within the past couple of years, really since – EA sports came out with, you know, the video games and then they had to shut it down ever since that. It's been a hot topic nationally. There are several bills, um, in the legislative process in the last two years that are addressing this. People are introducing bills to try to target this and to allow college athletes the same, really the same rights as any other person, right? Because if I'm just Joe Schmo on campus, it doesn't matter. I can have my own business and promote it all I want. Mm -hmm. It's my right of publicity, right? Is what Mm -hmm. it's called for everybody else legally, but in the NCA, it's name image likeness. And so that's, that's so interesting because with NCA football and baseball, I know that baseball was a big game that everyone played. I played it, but if I'm a player and I see that my, my names being, or it's not, they didn't use names, but it was literally like, it, you could tell it was you. It was, yeah, you could tell it was yeah. you. And I wasn't getting paid for that. Yep. Or cause it'd be, cause major league baseball, if I, if I remember correctly, MLB, the show those video games, they pay the union, right? And then mm-hmm. the union ends up divvying up that money to all the players. Correct. And cause it's copyright. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the, um, it's in a bill right now that's in Congress. That's one of the ideas is, so there's a mix between name image likeness, NIL and paying players outright, which is another conversation as well. Mm-hmm. What's the balance. And for the record, like I'm, pro players should be able to use their own name and image to profit. But I also understand that there are a ton of nuances to that. Well, Um, it goes back. It's Pandora's box. I'm I, and I've said it before I'm for athletes getting paid, but I'm also, I can see that other side and be like, that's a slippery slope. It's a ginormous slippery slope because let's get back to, if we allow student athletes to just, you know, profit off their social media, just like everybody else. How do you, how do you control what they are sponsoring? Because they're still representing your institution. So we'll say Trevor Lawrence, he's still representing Clemson. 
he's making money because he's a Clemson student athlete. So as an institution, do I get a say in who he gets to, who sponsors him or what he represents? Because what if he represents a company that has some shady dealings or mm-hmm. it's not really a, um, image appropriate, an, a, appropriate image. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea from the compliance side is, yeah, I can't track a lot of this stuff and there's a lot of gray area, but then if you allow it, how am I going to track that? You know, again, I'm going back to, I have to literally stalk social media pages. So it's like both sides are super hard to enforce, you know, and it's very hard to just open it up completely and just be like, yeah, do whatever you want, you know, because then you're going to have 95% of your student athlete body isn't going to be making any money from that. It's going to be five, six, seven players who make really, Mm -hmm. really, really good money. But then the rest of your student athletes are like, what the hell? You know, and that's not, that's not, but, but the, at the, the flip, flip side, side like says, I've made that university right. a ton of money. Well, that's 100%. true. That's very true. I, I mean, mean the, the flip side, sorry, the flip side of that argument is, let's say I'm Trevor Lawrence, right? Mm-hmm. I look in the stands and I see 50,000 people wearing my jersey number. Yep. My jersey number. Not, not the third string lineman's jersey number, mine. Yep. I know that jersey retails at $60. That's a lot of money. I know. And like at its face, you know, I. ESPN is talking about me all the time. Yeah. And, and that's the Everybody's thing. Everybody's right? talking about me. It's like you've earned Now they're that talking right. about Clemson. Well, think about like these 100,000 people are in the stands because of me. Well, Justin Bieber ends up making, he's making more money than like at, when he was in his pr- like prime early years. Yeah. Like he's still in his prime, but in, in his early years. That's debatable. That, <laughs> I don't know. His album, like, <laughs> you better make fun of him. I think it's pretty it. good. But even Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift's my age and she was raking in all this money. And if I was a Mizzou football player, like if I was Chase Daniels, I'd be super pissed because I'm making this university a lot of money. Everyone knows who I am. Sam Bradford, same deal during that time frame. And we're competing for national championships. I'm as popular as Taylor Swift and I'm not getting paid. I'm getting paid the basically i would call it minimum wage tuition well and and it's the fact that you're not getting paid you see everybody making money off you everybody is even you know you know stores in the mall are selling your stuff making money off of you right and there's like little yeah Yeah. copyright like i mean everybody's making rally houses are making money off you you're not and on top of that beer sales i can't even go get a job because i'm I'm in the weight room. I'm in practice. I'm in school. I'm doing everything 80 hours a week. I, I don't have time to even get a job. Yep. You know, I think the, the the term is called indentured servant. Yeah. That, that's been thrown around. And it, it's just a difficult, difficult thing because, yes, at this, on one hand, they have earned that right, right? Yep. They've put in the hours. They've put in the work. They have made themselves into a marketable product at that point. But on the flip side, to play devil's advocate, like we said, it's going to be five guys. And on a football team, you have yeah. 100. What kind of – you're getting into a oh, team yeah. culture issue there. For sure. Because you're going to have a ton of resentment. Well, Because on one hand, yeah, you get it. Like, okay, Trevor's our guy. But, like, he's making, as a college athlete, he could make $300,000. And I'm still only making – whatever my scholarship is, if I have a scholarship. So it's then like, you're getting like into the, a culture issue where there's going to be a ton of clash. It seems like we're in the very beginnings of when like big money was coming into baseball, like Babe Ruth getting paid what he was getting yeah. paid. And then everyone else was just literally getting paid chump change. Like I could only imagine what the dynamics were on that. Team. Right. So it's just, it's, it's like, it's some well, how point, do you make it equal? Cause like I, I didn't deserve to get paid. No, I mean, my, I, didn't, my, I didn't either. My eight yeah. ERA in division two baseball wasn't worthy of getting money. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't think, in my opinion, and again, this is speculation in my opinion, but like, I don't ever see institutions having having to pay athletes themselves. I, in my opinion, I don't see it being possible unless you're a power five. To They're directly, talking about the stipend though, right? The and stipend's possible. Be? And then what I see happening are one of two options or both. One option is just allowing them to make money off of their own name, image, and likeness if possible. Um, but again, we talked about all the issues that come along with that. 
And the other thing is, um, and this is something that's been introduced recently was it's like, uh, like revenue sharing, or I forget the actual term at what it was. It was group licensing. Hmm. So basically the NCAA makes all this money off of TV contracts, off of the college football playoffs, off of March madness. One thing they could do is, okay, the money that's made off of all those li- licensing deals, whether that be t-shirts, jerseys, TV deals, we're going to split that up, divide it amongst all our college athletes, and you get paid, everybody gets paid the exact same based on that. Like, hmm. you're still getting paid. But technically, they already do that, Is that, right? is that across all extent, levels? they do. Because they, they, they share it with the universities. Like, the SEC, I think they're getting close to one bill per year. Yeah. On on Rev is that is that across all levels? So D three athletes make the same as a Division one athlete. See, that's another thing. It's like how do you the there would, you would the think SEC athlete that's the might, same as the that might OVC? kill that might kill Division three. Yeah, that could kill it. Well, and what's even happening now? Because I heard the Pac twelve is talking about paying athletes sooner than anyone else. So does that mean every so? Naturally, you would think most athletes are going to go out to the Pac-12. I want to go get yeah, paid, Pac- right? Well, if I'm getting if I'm getting recruited by Stanford versus Alabama, yeah. there's a huge disparity there. Yeah, so like education then, wise, yeah, I I win with Stanford. Yeah. Baseball wise, I mean it's comparable. It goes back to the whole reason the NCAA is blocking is equality. They want to yeah. keep everything together, right? Because if Pac-12, if the Pac-12 decides to do that, they're essentially they're going to be their own breaking NCAA. away. And they will only be limited to playing Pac-12 teams. Yep. So yeah, you can pay your players, but you're going to play the same. Yeah, the NCAA same say, ten yeah. teams. They're gonna then play. basically you're seeing you're going to see same. like is a free market economy. It'll it'll turn into the haves and the have-nots. Oh yeah. And it'll be a, if that happens, it'll be a completely broken market. You're just it's going to be conference by conference. Your Power Five schools will make it, and your mid majors and below are going to turn into essentially just and they're gonna cut sports they're gonna cut a lot of things they're gonna cut a ton of sports because they're not gonna have funding and if mm-hmm. they do have the funding it's basically gonna turn into just a club option because i mean how does a mid-major survive with their football program because well, they not, come in they're to, not getting the fans they that come the into mizzou and get paid a million dollars to get their yep. butt kicked that's, that's so basically ton. that's basically how they survive their football program their budgets got killed this year with covid yeah it's a ton of money that they make off of games like that so that basically they play that one game to basically support the rest of the year. That yeah. It I mean helps a it's lot. not the only thing, but it's a big I mean it's a significant chunk. Like you know, what is Simo I mean, fo- did football. That? Recently they've been very 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 successful at the FCS level. Very successful. But I mean, if we're being honest, they're no powerhouse. They're obviously not a powerhouse FBS school. Yeah. But we go play Ole Miss, we go play Mizzou and they're making at least Three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars from that game, that supports. We go back to the whole revenue sharing thing. That supports not only the football team for that year, that's supporting gymnastics, tennis, baseball, golf. You know. So it's like a suicide mission, basically, to essentially help everybody. That's why. That's why those big schools are so ticked when they lose those games. Because not only are they, <laughs> they losing, just, they, losing, they got embarrassed on a national TV, but they're also losing hundreds of thousands of dollars to lose. That's why coaches get fired. Yeah. You lose one of those games, you're on the hot seat immediately. I mean, that that would suck to write that bill. Like literally, like we just lost thirty to twenty, unbelievable. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But I don't know. It's, I think, it's definitely the closest now it's ever been to change happening. But it's still a question of how soon. And there is going to be a ton of even if something would get passed, you know, hey we're going to pass this bill and athletes are going to be able to profit off their name, image, likeness. Okay. You've told us that, but now what are the nuances? How do we order the limits? How do you what? monitor that? I mean, that's yeah. just, and the problem is a lot of these people who are introduced the legislation, the vast majority of them have no idea how a college campus works. Mm-hmm. They're doing it because it looks good on paper and they probably do care, you know, about athletes. They probably do, but they just don't, understand how it works like one of the ones that's out there is like they get an nil compensation which we talked about but they also get 50 percent profit and then one of the like options is your scholarship for as long as your degree takes which is already a thing like there's fifth year scholarships mm-hmm. available mm-hmm. 
at almost every institution, like schools are already doing that. They want to like implement medical cost um, if you need it after college sports. So I think football players, if they have a traumatic injury, the NCAA already has a health insurance program that you can access hmm. after your college. So it's like a lot of those things are already in place, you know? So it's just, it's a matter of finding the right bill to get passed. And it might not even be a legislative thing. It might be an NCAA thing. If the NCAA does it first, then all those things don't matter. But there's just it's a lot tough, of man. Like I'm just thinking from an athlete's perspective that I only got a short window to, and I, and I might not play pro ball. I might not be good enough, but I'm good enough. And I have a name inside of college sports. Mm-hmm. Like Tim Tebow, that if it wasn't in where we are now, that dude was not going to play professional football without a doubt. Like yeah. he just struggled, but he had such a big brand, such a big name. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to take my chances on him. Now, what happens if you're, if he didn't have that and he was really good, he has a fan base and social media isn't a thing and he's not getting paid for that. What is he going to do the rest of his life? You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I should be able to cash out on that. Right. I mean, Taylor's, it goes back to that Dude, Taylor Swift thing. Like Taylor Swift is good enough to sing. It's just yeah. a slippery I'm good enough slope. To, I'm a good enough to entertain some fans. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I'm all for trying to find ways to get athletes to be able to make money off of what I think they deserve. But cause you put so just, many hours, it, it's you put so <laughs> many hours, and you put and in way different. more hours than the average college student who gets to do this. Yeah. And it's, di- it's different because like, you're done really learning. Like your learning mode for sports is like, you're still learning, but like your vast majority is you're learning from five years old all the way up until you get recruited. Right. And then the argument is, well, other students aren't getting paid. Yeah. They can get another job, but also they're still learning. They're preparing for this career outside of college. Yeah. I'm already in my career. Mm-hmm. That's where it gets stuck. I'm like, come on, we got to figure something out, at least something like where it could be like a compensation at the end of their career where it's like a retirement type of situation. Because that's the one that I've heard that I've liked the most that they they're able to put money that they can't use right now, but they can put it into like a retirement fund. Oh, I think that's a perfect situation. Once they're out, now they can benefit off of that. But even not even not even giving them the money after they play, like you put it in a Roth IRA. Yeah, you have to sit in it for a little while. Yeah, right? you have to sit in it. Like I mean, it, that's it's a, into that's, different mutual funds. I like that. I've like, heard that one thrown out. That because SEC like. is almost to a bill. Because then you one then you bill. stop. If, if you do it that way, and I know we're getting off tangent, but if you do it that way, you kind of stop the whole wild wild west effect of happening. Because what the NCAA is looking at is they want to keep this cash cow and this machine rolling. They don't yeah. want this thing to, to veer off well, course. So do pro sports. I mean, yeah, oh, everybody does. Pro sports does. have a free minor league system. Yeah, everybody does. So, But if you let if you let Trevor Lawrence go sell his likeness and you go do all this and then everybody else does it and then the imagery gets lost and then people stop watching because they don't like what it's turning into, then the TV deals are less significant and then people are less in the stands. And now it's gone. Yeah. I mean, the retirement makes perfect sense because if you can get someone early into retirement and they start at 18 years old and it, and it is a revenue share across all the athletes. And if it's just a hundred bucks or 50 bucks a month or 25 bucks a month, that's, that could be life changing money when they're done working at 65. Like the whole Allen Iverson thing, the deal that he had with Reebok where he literally went dirt poor and then at a certain, I forgot what age it was, they had to basically pay him out. That was a brilliant move by Allen Iverson's agent, whoever made that up. Like, yeah, this guy's going to spend all this money. Yeah. I need to make it some type of deal for him. I think that's super smart to have a retirement fund and not pay the athlete right up stop. Like, I never thought about this. Like, I think it's a brilliant idea. Mm-hmm. Give them the Roth IRA, let it accumulate, and then they can add into it as they get mm-hmm. into their work career. I think it's the best option. Obviously that doesn't solve the issue of right. We're assuming that they're well off enough in college at that point. Yeah. yeah. Because if you're not well off enough, yeah, I might get that money in the future, but I'm still going to illegally sign my, I need money. T-shirt. Now. Yeah. I need, money. <laughs> I'm hungry, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I need money now. So they're still going to be doing stuff under the table yeah. to get that money whenever they're in college. I mean, that is true. So I mean, it's like, like I said, I mean, I don't, I don't pretend to have the answer. Yep. There are, it's a fun it's conversation. A very, oh, you could spend a lot of time on it. Oh, yeah. And we'll see what happens. But I, I think we're closer now than ever. There's way more talk about it nationally. 
There's a big push for it. There's obviously a huge market for it. When there's money, I think somebody's going to figure uh, it out. And decisions always tend to happen after like class action lawsuits get a little bit of uh, movement behind them, you know? Yeah, and there's been plenty with the NCAA. Oh, yeah. But I don't know. We'll see. It's a tricky subject right now, man. It's I don't know what the answer is. Well, we're we're approaching a pretty pretty steep yeah. time here. I mean, it's been a fun conversation overall, and I mean, I could go down this route even longer. It's just, there's just so many different questions that come into, into play, and then when you when you say compliance, people go, "Man, that sounds really boring." But if you yeah, start they need a new digging, title. They need to rebrand. They need name. to rebrand it. Like yeah. it's a bad branding name. Like yeah, the is. conversations we've had has just been. Damn, I never thought about that. Yeah. There's a, I mean, there's a lot to compliance. And I think a lot of people shut down right away, college coaches, college athletes, parents, when you hear that. But because it's lawyers I, talk, it's yeah. in the ling- when you read language, it's not sexy. It, yeah. it, rules, you literally glaze over. It's like reading some financial reports. Mm-hmm. You're just like, dude, this Whoops. sucks. Yeah. And the best advice I can give is, and I'm going to, pump up the compliance world right now compliance Someone officers, in the other line, compliance, yes! compliance, compliance officers across the world or across <laughs> the nation would be like yeah i love this guy but like yes some of this stuff is not the most interesting things like it is not fun to sit through a compliance meeting where they're telling you and educating you on new rules like that's not mm-hmm. fun i get it that said they can be if you utilize them some of the best resources you have on campus so whether you're a college athlete, whether you're a college coach, or if you're a parent, like th- if there's one office who's fantastic at handling parent calls, it's the compliance office because like we've covered, guess who they know on campus? Literally almost everybody. Admissions, they work ridiculously close with financial aid on campus. They know everybody in the athletic department because <clears throat> they work with them every day. Mm-hmm. It's like if you have a question as a parent or as a player or an incoming student athlete, the compliance office, if they don't know it, which I don't pretend to know everything, but I can sure as heck get you to who does because I work with them every day. It's, it's rules is understanding the playing field and play and knowing what the game you can actually do inside the game. 100%. That's what I love. I love having conversations about obscure baseball rules because then you get a little bit smarter on what you can and cannot do inside the game that no one else really knows. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's super valuable if you know somebody inside compliance and really just like having this type of conversation. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a lot of coaches who try to get in. They might pretend like they don't like you, but they try to get in real good with you because I know they can, that you can get them guys they want, girls they want, Mm -hmm. or just help them whenever they, it's not finding loopholes. It's knowing the rules and how to navigate it. Yeah, you, I mean, you got to you gotta know how to get in it. You're not bending any rules, but you know how to, okay, this avenue doesn't work, but I can take you down this road, and we can still end up at the same destination. It's like the episode of Suits. Like, su- the yeah. Suits, uh, you don't watch Suits, do you? I have watched Suits, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they find... You find a way. You find a way. Yep. There's always a way. Yeah. Not always, but... Yeah, that's true. You can find, well, you with can Harvey, find a way. Well, with Harvey Specter, <laughs> with Harvey there's Specter's, always a way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The guy always wins. He's a winner. <laughs> But there might not be a way, but they're going to, they're the people that know how to get there if there is. So definitely, definitely a valuable resource, just not the best brand name. Yeah. But it is an interesting topic and it's something that obviously I enjoy. Um, It's what led me to where I'm at now in law Mm -hmm. school. So I had no idea where this conversation would go. Yeah, I, I mean, I was, I was planning for 30 minutes and then now we're sitting here for a long time and it feels like a closing pitch podcast Yeah, and this is a tiger interview series, but I want to do a closing pitch cause there's a lot of information there and I, I do, I want a recap from you guys kind of get your thoughts on it. Let's go through closing pitches and then I'll close it out. Okay. Dave, what's your closing pitch? So I liked from a standpoint, if you're a, if you're a parent or a player or even a coach who who oversees parents and players on a regular basis, I like understanding the importance of this because, you know, I've been in this now, this is my 11th year with the Tigers and my first, you know, handful of years and I was dealing directly with people who were getting recruited. I couldn't have told you 90% of the things that you just said today. I had no idea. And I still don't know all of it but I am certainly informed enough to help people along that path. And it's very important. 
you know, like getting yourself signed up for the eligibility center early, making sure you know all the things you need to do to become eligible, to become an NCAA athlete. And then basically understanding all the nuances to keep yourself eligible, what you can and can't do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's incredibly important, especially with the growing social media, with the growing just so many opportunities out there to basically get yourself in trouble. And there's new ones every day. And so if you want to become a college athlete, if you want that opportunity, it's really important to understand this information. So that's what I got out of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll reiterate some of the things I said. I think touching on what you were just talking about with your closing pitch, um, understand that the compliance department and the NCAA eligibility center and things of that nature are extremely, extremely, extremely important to do early, be on top, be on top of it, log into all that stuff. Um, and then compliance officers, even if you don't know where you're going or if you haven't committed to a school, if you're talking to a school, reach out to them. They're going to be more often than not, they're going to be more than happy to help you because if they can get it a year and a half advance done, that makes their job so, so much easier. Um, so definitely reach out to them. They are definitely somebody to get to know once you're on campus and then, um, to go with the parents and players and coaches, you know, organizations like you guys, you know, if you're a big youth sports organization, I think in my opinion, this is something that you need to discuss with your teams and with your players. Um, it doesn't have to be all the time, you know, maybe once a year, just be like, Hey guys, you know, your juniors now or your sophomores now, here's some things to keep on the, keep on the horizon or keep in the back of your mind. Um, just to give that education, because I think a lot of high school athletes, they don't think about this stuff. And a lot of parents have no idea. They haven't gone through it before, you know? So, um, just keep it on the forefront. And if you're an organization, I think it's something that you should look into and maybe have talks with, with your parents, especially mm -hmm. and your players. My closing pitch is it's intriguing for retirement funds for players. I think that is something that I'm hoping the NCAA will go down that route. Yeah. Super important for a young person. I'm talking like I'm like 90 years old, like <laughs> back in the day. But I do think that's a vital, very vital for someone because, I mean, I, was, I think 40% of Americans only have $400 worth of savings. Yeah. That's a crazy number, mm -hmm. just being able to have access to $400 of investments. Yeah. So I think that's number one. That should be a number one priority for the NCAA. Second thing that is for our audience is that I hope that this opened up some eyes for some people and also showed that I need to know the landscape of a college and know who my tools are and where my resources are and be able to know when to use that tool at a specific moment. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even talk about like our, our PTs, mm -hmm. like knowing, knowing our athletic trainers, oh, yeah. our strength trainers. But if you know the academic side, man, that's some free cash money that's going to help you get good grades and get a better education mm -hmm. and then yeah. be able to open some doors. You have, you have no idea that it could lead you to an internship that you didn't even realize because you developed mm -hmm. that relationship Absolutely. with the compliance part department or your academic advisor. Yeah. And I failed to shout out the uh, strength staffs and mm -hmm. athletic training staffs, but man, they're huge and they're some of the best people. So my apologies to those people, <laughs> but <laughs> you guys are awesome guys. That's, um, that's this, side of the tiger interview um i might put this on the closing pitch just because it i saw it, it. Had, i knew you were gonna do it it had it had that <laughs> closing pitch-esque feel to it as we were talking i'm like man this is really good yep um so guys subscribe to our youtube channel that's where we're putting the tiger tv series uh our Ti tiger interview series um we're also doing it on our facebook page but i like youtube a little bit better um and then also uh, subscribe to our closing pitch podcast we'll catch you in the next episode see you guys